expectation in day to day practice our speaker needs uh, does not need uh, extensive introduction he is one of our own uh, dr mevan vijaytunga he is a consultant cardiologist and cardiac electrophysiologist and, and vascular services altru health system north dakota us Uh, Dr. Vijay Tung qualified in MBBS from University of Colombo and subsequently trained in Sweden and US. He has over 35 publications and also functions as a peer reviewer in uh, Journal of Clinical Infectious Diseases, Europe's Journal of Cardiac Electrophysiology, Annals of Internal Medicine and Alcohol and Drug Review. Over to you Dr. Vijay Tung. Good afternoon. Um, I hope uh, you all can hear me, and thanks for the uh, kind introduction. Just one second. Hello, Kamal. I uh, know no, it's okay. I'm on my sessions now. Thank you, Kamal. Um, do you hear me? Okay. Thank you. No, I mean through the Zoom call. Okay, thank you. I think I'm connected. Thank you so much, Paul. Do you hear me now? Okay, yeah, we can hear you nice and clear. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Come. On. Yeah. Let me uh, started sharing my um um my slides. I think that's where the um the importance is. So I go to the shared screen. a uh, mode um of uh so one issue is just give me one second um I do have one issue here when I uh, share the slides you might see only part of my slides but um hmm all right uh, can you see my slides now do you see the full slide or partial slide I can see the full slide yeah Okay. Okay. Um, so, uh, try not to have the. Okay, you have a full slide. I hope, um, but you see the side on this. But anyway, let me start here. Uh, thanks for the invitation, and I believe you are going to have a question and answer, which is to your right side of the screen. Uh, I'm told, and you need to turn that on to see the questions. So, the format that I am going to use here is um, this for the. for this uh, for this discussion i'm going to use this ecg format which is um leads 1 and 2 and 3 and the avi area area of the limb leads on the on the to the left of the screen uh, left of this ecg and the and the surface um the uh, precordial leads on on the right side and and then you will have um um the rhythm strip at the bottom and the paper speed is 25 mm per second and amplitude like this um let me zoom up further so you don't um you see the entire slide like this and then there you are so so that's the format i'm going to use like this the precordial and the limb leads and the rhythm strip and the paper speed and the amplitude so let's go to question number 1 if you can put that up please and if you put the question number 1 so this is a 77 year old man with a history of uh, hypertension and parkinson's disease and he presents with high fever intermittent dizziness and falls the ecg shows the extrinsic electrical artifact tremor artifact loose limb placement in electrodes 1 3 avl avr and v1 or rigors due to skeletal muscle artifact the patient has high fever now you can go and choose uh, your answers a b 1 2 3 4 a b c d and then uh, we'll have one minute
on the side of the screen i cannot see it from this end yes can see it actually yeah, yeah. I, uh, i just need to see both screens here yeah you can analyze the answers now yeah one minute is up yeah if i can see the answers i think there is a time gap between when i talk to you um i don't see the answers on my screen yet your clue is in the parkinsonism part isn't it sir what did you choose the parkinsonism sir? okay that's a bit on the okay sorry i didn't see the answers so okay let me move on uh, actually the answer is number 1 ele- extrinsic electrical artifact Uh, I posed the question with Parkinson's because I thought, uh, you know, also I put uh, rigors because the patient has fever. Now, let me explain why. Um, and the reason is the nature of this artifact. As you see in, in electrophysiology, we call it a very high frequency artifact, very high frequency. You see the, the signal is very thick and, and very tightly connected. Like it's not a muscular artifact as such. the other thing i noticed you notice is that it's confined to some electrodes predominantly like 1 2 3 4 now that is the point i need to get you to get it that this is not a generalized artifact because some people believe like if it's an extrinsic electrical artifact since it's coming from an external source you expect everything to be affected all leads to be affected but this is a case where the patient had a uh, so called I know this may not be common in Sri Lanka, but just to know, this patient had a, this is not a pacemaker. This is a, a, a deep brain stimulator implanted for Parkinsonism, and this lead goes to the brain. Uh, there is a similar one implanted on the, on the right side, but there was no wiring connection. But this is not uncommon. People usually get bilateral implants and one connected to the brain. And this is what, what was causing artifact. That's the reason, and, and this is how it goes. Uh, sort of a similar to the pacemaker but the only thing is that the lead is being implanted deep in the brain so so what happened is in this case the 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 way the the pulse generator is implanted on the left side and you can imagine that the lead leads how they are placed like you know so lead 1 which is basically has its axis horizontally in the in the um uh in this particular plane can get affected because the the, the lead axis is it, it confronts the, the the electricity emanating from the pulse generator and so is the case you can imagine lead 3 which which involves the uh, the left uh, left upper extremity as part of its axis but as you see lead 2 does not involve left limb and it does not have this artifact now the, so the the, the te- teaching point and similarly you can argue back and how uh, lead, lead uh, avl for example is affected because lead avl is a derivative of lead 1 and 2 so lead avl gets it but less so in avr and avf so like that you can work this out but but the point here is this by purely looking at this this can look like uh, a tremor artifact but it's but it's too high frequency to call it tremor and it's confined to certain leads and just for the curiosity i looked around what's going on with this patient and this was the reason uh, because when you turned off this pulse generator of course the patient didn't feel well because his parkinson symptoms recurred at the same time the ecg artifact disappeared so that's question 1 i didn't want to trick you but want to think you through those lines um this is a uh, question number 2 uh if you can put that up please and this is a 35 year old man with obesity hypertension and irregular pulse and this was noted during routine physical exam what does the ecg show this should be a pretty simple one does it show sinus arrest morbid type 1 second degree av block which is wenkiba pattern or type 2 second degree av block or sinus rhythm with premature atrial complexes you can put the answers uh, up now you have my, one minute and please let me know when the uh, when you are ready uh, dr kote gore please let me know so i can move on Okay, I think time's up. Yeah, time's up. Then what's the answer? Comment. What is the 
What's the, uh, oh yeah, I see the answers. So there's 50-50 for Movitz type 1 and uh, premature atrial complexes. The, the correct answer is the last one. And, and, and let's go through this quickly because by, by how do you know this is premature atrial complexes and, 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 and not the other one? So the key here is noticing, I hope you can see my Zoom trick here, to notice that, first of all, you see that there is a pattern of beating, two beats, and there's a gap, two beats, gap, two beats, gap. And I'll talk about this gap a little later. But when you zoom up, now this is another very simple thing I want to illustrate. If you have an ECG, try to make sense out of it uh, so that the uh, best way for me is to, to, to see what's going on is to zoom it. Electronically, you can do it much better today, but if not, have a magnifying glass and zoom it up because you can put it, put the leads in a particular order and then zoom up. Then you can see what's going on. And here you can appreciate that when there is a pattern of beating, the first P wave looks different from the second P wave. Now these changes are subtle. So you need to zoom or have a very trained eye to see this uh, when somebody gives you a piece of paper or sh should have a very sharp uh, uh, vis vision. If you don't, just zoom up and you can see there's a double hump on this second P wave, whereas the first P wave does not. So this is a premature atrial complex because it, 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 it originates from a different part of the atrium. So, so here it's a premature atrial complexes every other beat or in what we call a bigemini. And when that happens, the sinus node gets reset, and I'll talk about that later. So there's a tiny pause, and then this pattern recurs. So this is a 35-year-old man with obesity and hypertension, which is getting common in Sri Lanka. And these patients are very prone to develop this type of premature atrial complexes frequently, and then it gets worse with time. And ultimately, these premature atrial complexes can lead to tachycardias and, and more commonly atrial fibrillation. So that's the thing. So uh, hopefully this is too simple for some, but sinus node fires. And as you know, the electricity travels through the atrium, through the AV node and a bundle of his, and then from there to right and left bundles. Uh, and so in this case, and another focus in the atrium, it could be right or left atrium or in the upper or lower part of the atrium, fires. And usually in these patients, these signals come from left atrium or pulmonary veins, particularly these uh, patients who are prone to develop atrial fibrillation. Okay, okay. this is question number three. Uh, if you can uh, put that up, please. Um, and this is a 65-year-old uh, patient with uh, new onset palpitations, of fatigue, and mild shortness of breath with exertion. What does the ECG show? Is it sinus rhythm? with premature ventricular complexes in bigemini or sinus rhythm with premature atrial complexes in bigemini or morbid type one second degree AV block, which is Venkipa, or just sinus node dysfunction. And please answer within a minute and Dr. Kortegora can enlighten me when you're ready. Okay, we can move on. So, yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Please put up the answers. Okay. So um, the correct answer is two 50-50 answers, but then let's go through. That's the whole purpose of this exercise. So what you notice is, again, there is a pattern of beating every other beat, and there's a small gap and every other beat. And then the second beat in this instance looks different compared to the first beat. So a lot of you guessed that this is a, a different complex, QRS complex, we're probably coming from the ventricle. Now, again, um, this requires little training. Uh, so that's part of the exercise today is, how do you know this is coming from the ventricle or from elsewhere? Actually, the correct answer is number two. This is sinus rhythm with premature atrial, comp premature atrial complexes in, in bigemini. So bigemini means every other beat that there is a pattern. But if it is called premature atrial complex, you will argue, okay, there should be a P wave somewhere. And this is why I said, if you're not familiar, zoom up and then start, that's one trick, to zoom, zoom, zoom. Electrical, uh, today you have everything on uh, mobile telephones, but not just zoom, because human eye can only see so much. And then have try to see, that's number one trick. Number two is, when you have a pattern, always try from one end to the other, follow the 
uh, QRS complex as P waves and see whether is there a pattern that differs from one against the other. And one thing I noticed here is that you have to look around all leads and here you can see, uh, sorry, let me go back. Um, and I, I will talk to you about why this is a premature atrial complex in a moment. And, 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 and here, actually, you can see a P wave, and sometimes the P wave is a little bit hidden in the preceding preceding P wave. So why is then this QRS different? So if it's a premature atrial complex, why is this QRS different? Now, now to know that, just a basic electrophysiology. Now, you don't need to be uh, 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 a detailed, uh, you know, you don't need to have detailed knowledge in this, but a very simple thing is that when you think of heart as an electrical organ, electricity, you know, the heart cannot conduct continuously. It's not like a, a piece of metal that can conduct continuously. It has to depolarize. And once it depolarizes uh, during this ex action potential, which is this one, just straight going up, con phase zero. But once it depolarizes, it has to repolarize before it can uh, depolarize again. And during this repolarization, at the initial part of repolarization, the heart, uh, uh, the heart muscle cannot, however high, uh, strong stimulus you 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 put it on, uh, it cannot depolarize again. And that's what we call absolute refractory period. It's refractory. It cannot fire again. During the latter part of repolarization, if you use a stronger signal, it might conduct or it might uh, degenerate an action potential, but it will be slow. So that's a relative refractory period, and the whole thing is called total refractory period. So what happens is, let's say the first sinus beat is conducted here. So this is a sinus beat is conducted. As soon as you get the QRS complex, think about the ventricle, there's a refractory period. And once you get over the refractory period, you get the next excitable period, and then it can conduct. Now, in this case, there is a premature beat. Premature beat. What happens is this premature beat goes to the ventricle, but in the ventricle, it has to go to the right bundle and the left bundle. Now, the, the right bundle usually has a longer refractory period. That is normal in all of us. Right bundle has a longer refractory period compared to the left bundle. So when the premature beat enters the ventricle, the right bundle does not accept this as, as well as a left bundle. So it travels down through the left bundle and it goes slowly through the right bundle because it's in the relative refractory period. And then you get this right bundle branch block pattern, which is a functional issue. So that is called right bundle branch block aberration because of the, because the premature beat falls within the refractory period. And, and that's what happened here. So that's called QRS aberration, if you ask what it is. QRS aberration means an impulse coming from the upper part of the heart conducted abnormally to the ventricle. Now, the patient, if you have under the baseline conditions, may not have abnormal QRS. It may look pretty normal. But when a premature beat comes, QRS aberrates because the conduction is slow. QRS morphology is altered. And that's what happens here. And uh, uh, if, uh, again, I use my zoom here, you get a sinus beat, and then you can see the premature beat here. The sinus beat has up, uh, like upward going complex here. Here it has a double hump. And, and then that premature beat, when it conducts to the ventricle, I'm only focusing on the ventricle here. If you are sharp enough, you will see that even the PR interval is longer here compared to that one. But, but ventricle is... If the right bundle is not ready to accept it, so there is a right bundle branch block aberration. The key here is, the learning point is, when you see this kind of pattern, just look around, and particularly around the preceding uh, T wave. And if you do that, you can see that there is a, 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 a PAC, or premature atrial complex. So sometimes when this happens, uh, some patients, it's not the right bundle that aberrates. It's not the right bundle that is refractory. Uh, like in this case, you have a normal P wave, normal P wave, and here there is another P hidden in the T wave. Now you may ask, I can't see the P wave, but if you compare, if you go through all the leads, you can see, for example, here, um, 
this T wave looks different compared to that T wave. There's a sharpness here because they are, the reason, the way you extrapolate is uh, there is a P wave hidden inside here because of this, this T looks different from that. Now, is it my imagination? Well, I argue back and say, look at the following QRS, that QRS is different. And then I argue back and say, yes, there must be a hidden P wave here conducted. Now, this part in this scenario, unlike the previous one, is conducted uh, through the right bundle, but the left bundle is slow. You get a left bundle branch block aberrancy here. So commonly, in normally healthy people, you will see often on telemetry or if you monitor the patient, you can see a lot of extra beats, but commonly this conducts with the right bundle branch block pattern due to the right bundle branch block refractoriness, but in some patients it can be left bundle like this. So I hope that you got the key point there. And uh, this is the next question. If you can put that up, please. Uh, and this is uh, what pretty much what does the ECG show? Is it sinus arrest, morbid type one, secondary gravy block, which is Venkiba, or is it non conducted premature atrial complexes or morbid type two? Please answer, and Dr. Kotegur, please enlighten me when you're ready. Thank you, and I see the answers. Most of you call it sinus arrest, and others call it morbid type two. Actually, the answers are neither. The answer is non-conducted premature atrial complex. Now, let me explain why. Uh, again, when you have an ECG, I think since most of you missed it, uh, I'll, tell, I'll have to go back and say what's the basic part that you missed it. First of all, we all see there's a pattern of beating. There are four beats, a gap, four beats, a gap, four beats, a gap, right? And, and you see P wave, QRS, P, QRS, P, QRS, P, QRS, and there's nothing here. And when you see a gap, the first thing that you know, should notice is this. When there's a gap, first, what is the commonest thing for a gap when you have a telemetry patient? Most common thing when you have a gap like this is a non-conducted PAC. That is a pearl I want you to know. Before you go into the other things, make sure this is not a non-conducted, non-conducted PAC. That means a premature atrial complex. That means an early complex coming from the atrium did not go to the ventricle. So since it did not go to the ventricle, there is a gap. Okay, But how do I prove it? Look into each beat. Zoom them. I cannot emphasize enough how much this is necessary. So you see that the easiest way I prove it, I look at the preceding T wave, T wave, T wave, it looks sharper here. See that the fourth one here and, and they are by, and then I see a gap. And then I measure this, look at this one, P to P. This is beating about this P, that P, closer to 100 beats per minute. It's a regular, regular. But if I have a P wave here hidden in the QRS, it comes much earlier, right? It's, and when it comes in, that we did not get conducted to the ventricle. And that's why you have a gap. So there are P waves there. And the key here is noticing it. Otherwise, you might consider that this could be sinus arrest. There is no P wave. There's a reason why there is no sinus P. Why? This extra beat here came from another focus in the atrium. And so sinus node is ready to fire in this instance closer to 100 beats per minute. It's firing at 100 beats per minute. So it fires, for example, one, two, three, four, and the fifth beat was going to happen at 100 beats per minute. But before the fifth beat occurs, a premature atrial complex intervenes. So the premature atrial complex comes in and it depolarizes the atrium, including the sinus node. So sinus node cannot fire by itself. It takes a step back, a step back and then go back to its timing and fires again. So that's why you get a gap. Now, the premature atrial complex, since it's coming so early, it cannot find its way in this instance to the ventricle because 
the AV node has not recovered yet. Okay, that's what happened. So how do I prove this? Well, again, zoom up, and then I'll show you. You get the sinus P, <coughs> and then you get primary atrial complexes, and and you can see the sinus beat is occurring in a regular fashion. And then I'll explain to you this gap. Okay, so sinus beat is occurring in a regular manner. So what happens is, if the if there is no premature beat, you would have expected the sinus node to fire here. If the sinus node fired, would have fired here, next sinus beat should have fired down here. But instead, this premature complex fired early. By doing so, it didn't let sinus node to fire here. So sinus node reset itself to this rate and fired here. So sinus node, the subsequent sinus beat came early. So what happens is this P2P interval is shorter than this plus this. P2P interval is shorter than twice the sinus cycle length. And this is what we call a, this is a pause, but the pause is not equal to twice the sinus cycle length. Therefore, we call it a non-compensatory pause. It's the same thing here again. This is an important concept. People talk about compensatory pauses, non-compensatory pauses. This is what a non-compensatory pause. Your P wave goes to the atrium. If we know to the ventricle, this is called a ladder diagram. Ladder diagram means this looks like a inimaga, uh, and 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 it goes uh, explain how the con uh, impulse passes down from the atrium to the ventricle. P wave go to the atrium, AV node, and ventricle. P Q R S, P Q R S, and the premature atrial complex that arrives early. It in this instance uh, did not go to the ventricle. It did not go to the ventricle like here because it get blocked here. Why? Uh, the AV node is refractory, but what happens is the sinus node get reset. And when that happens, the subsequent sinus P comes early and this green is less than twice the red. So that is called a non-compensatory pause and, and, and premature atrial complexes often have a non-compensatory pause. So it doesn't mean always, there are very little thing in always in medicine even here, but if you see a gap here, and if you calculate P to P interval, and if it's less than twice what it would have been, then it's a non-compensatory pause, and that also strengthens your suspicion this must be a non-conducted premature complex. Okay, question number five. In the interest of time, I keep moving. Uh, if you can put that up, please. What does this ECG show? Now, this ECG, you can see heartbeat, 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 and there's a gap. And, and based on what I discussed earlier, what does this ECG show? Does it show the gap is due to sinus arrest, or is it due to Wenkiba pattern, or is it a first-degree AV block and a non-conducted premature complex, or intermittent complete heart block? Please vote, and then uh, let me know when you're ready in, within a minute. minute. So look at this gap for the pause. And this could be um, a telemetry nurse calling you and say the patient has pauses. So you look at it and what's your, what's your answer? Dr. Kotekul, uh, let me know when you're ready. <clears throat> um, okay, the the it's not a sinus arrest. The correct answer is number three. It's again similar to my previous discussion. That's why I'm highlighting. But you're getting better. Some of you are now noticing it. That's how we learn, and that's how I learn too. Again, you you see a pause. That's the first thing you notice. You see a pattern, sinus, sinus, it's a pause. Now, pause could be due to many things. Simple thing is, and most of you thought, the sinus node did not fire. Well, yeah, it did not fire, but there's a reason. Reason is, again, as I mentioned, look at the one. 
P, and then you agree there is a long PR interval or so-called first degree AV block. PR interval is greater than 200 or, uh, milliseconds or greater than five small boxes, P, P, P. But this is very subtle. This is what I'm coming at. Sometimes you might question whether it's true or not. If more, some of you, at least most of you will agree, this T wave looks, see, it's a small hump here when you look around, is probably, probably, is a little sharp point here. It's very subtle. Yeah, I don't know whether a human eye normally can do that. Maybe the young eyes can see it better than my eyes, uh, but, but there is a subtle change. And that's a P wave that's hidden there. And because of that, similar to the previous patient, that P wave came early because if you count P to P interval, P to P, P to P, the next P, a P to P should have been somewhere here, but this P wave came early and that got blocked. It didn't go to the ventricle and the sinus node got reset and started again. So, so the key here is this is not sin, uh, this is not sinus node dysfunction, but premature atrial complex basically inhibited the sinus node temporarily. And that's what it is. So look at the preceding T waves. So the, the key point here is you need to look very uh, in detail into the into the preceding uh, preceding complex and 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 if you are not sure, look around the other leads because uh, if you are sharp, if you agree with me, you can see this is this T is little different from the other. Now you might say this is just a basic variation. It could be, but I can argue with this hypothesis, and then it's difficult to refute that argument because you have a non-compensatory pause followed by this. There must be uh, a hidden. P wave here compared to the other. This is a little blunted compared to the other uh, T wave. But anyway, let's keep learning. So you can see it's a non-compensatory pause again because two, uh, the, the gap between the P and P here that encompassing the uh, PAC is less than twice uh, the P to P interval, what it would have been. Non-compensatory means it's less than twice the P to P interval. So what we learned so far is this. Premature atrial contractions can have three possible outcomes. They can conduct just like anything else. Anybody can recognize this. Some beat come early. There's a P wave and it conducts just like normal. So just a one, one extra beat. The other way is there is a premature complex arrive, but when it manages to go to the, to the ventricle, but even you can see uh, since it's come early, AV node is still not fully ready. It's a little refractory, so this PR interval is a little longer than the normal. But when it goes to the ventricle, commonly, the right bundle is in the relative refractory period compared to the left. So you conduct with right bundle branch block aberration in some people with left bundle. But you see a preceding P, and then which looks different from the other P. So this is a uh, second option for the PAC is to conduct to the ventricle with aberrancy. And the third option is it doesn't conduct at all, or the it, it, or what we call a blocked PAC, a blocked premature complex. But to know that when you see a gap, you need to look carefully uh, in the preceding T wave area, and then compare that with the other T waves, and then suddenly notice there could be a hidden P wave or premature complex there. So these are the so-called three fades of PACs. All right, question six. If you put that up, please. Uh, this is a 48-year-old uh, woman with palpitations and uh, my, has some mild chest discomfort with it. So what I'm asking is, what is the baseline rhythm? And what are these white complex beats highlighted here? So baseline rhythm is... First option is sinus, and highlighted beats are QRS aberrant beats. Number two is baseline rhythm is sinus. The white, uh, white QRS complexes are PVCs, or premature ventricular complexes, or ventricular ectopy. Third option is, this is atrial fibrillation, and the highlighted beats are QRS aberration, or this is atrial fibrillation with ventricular ectopy. Please vote. And when you're ready, you can uh, put the answers up. Huh? 
Yeah, so the answer is, this is uh, it, number three, atrial fibrillation with QRS aberrancy. Again, some of you guessed this is ventricular ectopy. This is a very common problem. And that's why I put it like ECG in day-to-day -day practice. We see this all the time. A patient is in atrial fibrillation. Somewhere in the atrial fibrillation, you get one beat or two beat or three beats or sometimes 10 beats of white QRS and everybody get panic. Uh, this is ventricular ectopy or ventricular tachycardia. Why? That QRS looks different compared to the other QRS. So look at this rhythm strip at the bottom. Uh, but but before going anywhere, you can see something just by eyeballing. Yes, it's different. For example, in lead V1, uh, these two beats, they look different. Uh, but when you go down to V3 or, or lead two, they are not that different. It's like somebody took the preceding QRS and just pulled it out, just pulled out. And 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 but again, it doesn't tell us. We can't know whether it's a ventricular ectopy or or is it or, or, or is it what we call aberration? And this is always a mind-boggling thing. And so I'm trying to give you some clues why this why why this is option number three. First of all, you need to notice that yes, this is white QRS, but what does it look like, particularly this beat? This looks like what I call a right bundle branch block pattern. Right bundle branch block pattern. Uh, this pattern sort of, a, if I see this, uh, in electrophysiology, we have a very simplified way of calling right bundle branch block pattern. If lead V1, V1 has a broad and upgoing, we call it right bundle. If V1 has broad and downgoing, we call it left bundle. This has a right bundle pattern. So let's figure out what, what this is. So this is a condition what we call Ashman phenomenon. I think some of you must have heard this. So let's dig into that. Ashman phenomenon is the same principle that I described earlier, but a little different. Let me explain that. So in sinus rhythm, as I mentioned earlier, it's very simple. Once you have a PQRS, 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 and after the QRS, there is this so-called refractory period. And then after the refractory period is over, you get the excitable period. So refractory, excitable, refractory, excitable. And this happens in a regular manner if your heart is beating regularly. So heart depolarizes, repolarizes, and ready to, uh, 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 repolarizes and ready to accept the next beat, then depolarizes here again, then you're, way, you're refractory, and then you're ready, and then you're refractory again, then you're ready like that. Now, this purple and green colored shaded areas represent refractoriness and excitable time period. The point you, I'm trying to um, um, indicate here is this. When the heartbeat is regular, you have a very regular refractory and excitable period. But there is a principle, for example, this refractory period is not a fixed one. Ex take an example, if you are exercising, if your heartbeat goes higher and higher, this refractory period normally shortens because if the refractory period doesn't shorten, you can't get the next heartbeat to happen. And that's physiological. So when the heartbeat gets fast and faster, the refractory period generally should shorten. Now, when it gets shortened, sometimes the right bundle, it doesn't get as shortened as the left bundle. Okay, because all areas should does not always equally shorten like that. That's one principle. The other principle is this. When if you look into the refractory period of any heartbeat, so the refractory period of this heartbeat, this heartbeat, that is determined by the what we call a RR interval, R to R interval of the preceding beat. Now that may be a little complex for you to understand. So that's why I put this image. You have a QRS. You have this refractory period. You have a QRS, you have this refractory period. My point is this how long this refractory period will be determined by how fast these two beats occur. Because if these two beats are happening faster, closer, then this refractory gets shorter. That's what happens during exercise when the heart beats faster. Since the, these two beats occur tighter, the refractory period also tightens. Now, in this instance, in irregular rhythm, in atrial fibrillation, your heartbeat is irregular. 
this interval is shorter compared to that interval. This is a longer interval. So if you are coming back after a longer interval, your refractory periods now get longer. If you are coming back after a shorter interval like this, your refractory period is shorter. So when, when you have a long interval, you get a longer refractory period. And in that instance, since you are in AFib, there is no regularity. If a beat managed to go to the ventricle, it might fall into the refractory period of the right bundle, and you can get the right bundle branch block aberration, just the same way I described earlier. And this was described in 1947 by a some group of people who noticed this, and that's called Ashman phenomenon. So Ashman phenomenon means in atrial fibrillation, when you have a long interval, and it can be followed by uh, a white QRS complex, but white QRS complex is just because the right bundle is um, refractory. But so to, to call it now, call it uh, Ashman, you need to have this pattern of things. So that gives a clue. That gives a clue that this could be uh, uh, coming from the top rather than coming from the bottom of the heart. So again, uh, that's what I explained here. Uh, that's a sinus rhythm, it's equally, and then the refractory period is determined by the preceding QR, uh, RR interval. But in this case, uh, this, uh, this interval determine how long this interval is going to be. But, and, and then since this RR interval is longer, the subsequent uh, refractoriness is also much longer. So, so that's why this beat got white QRS. So this is Ashman phenomena and, and usually um, uh, conducted with right bundle branch block morphology, and you can sometimes have multiple beats like that happen, okay? So, and this is a common problem. Uh, this is a, uh, a patient uh, I uh, happened to read about six hours ago, and I incorporated this slide since I thought this would be useful. This is a patient with uh, atrial uh, fibrillation and had an ambulatory heart monitor, and you can see the irregular rhythm. This is atrial fibrillation. And then you get these two white beads. And when I see these two white beads, the first thing I thought, okay, long and long, and this is short. So this could be uh, 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 aberrant or, or Ashman beat. Ashman beat means this is actually coming from the atrium, not from the ventricle. Not always, because if you see a ventricular ectopic also comes early, and that's why it's called premature ventricular ectopic. But there's some clue here. You have to think through. Look at this one. One clue is this. This interval, but this is what we call a coupling interval. Coupling intervals means when 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 two beats come together like a jaw doer, uh, coupling interval. This is a fixed coupling interval between that and that. If you agree that that QRS is similar to that one, so the question is whether this is an Ashman beat or whether it's a PVC. And one clue is that this coupling interval is similar to that. That suggests this is a PVC. Okay, and the other thing is this. Here, if you believe the opposite argument, this is Ashman beat, believing that this is long, short, then why do you get this one here? There is no long short here. So that argues against Ashman beat. So my point here is this, not all, when you see a white QRS complex, it's a probabilistic thing you are going to determine Nobody can be sometimes 100% sure whether it's a it's a atrial impulse conduct to the ventricle or is it the ventricular uh, impulse itself. But there are some clues. If you see a typical bundle branch block pattern, that's probably um, it's coming from the atrium. If you see a fixed couple interval, it's probably from the ventricle. And then just because you see long short intervals, it doesn't mean it's Ashman always like in this case. So you look, you look around and you see there is a similar beat without long shot, and then this has to be connected with the fixed coupling interval. This has to be ventricular impulse. Um, I'll be very happy to talk about this um, to you personally if you have questions uh, later on, um, because this is a very common clinical problem. Uh, very happy if you even throw, uh, throw cases at me, but maybe we have to do it not in this forum. Uh, even personally or emailing me or otherwise. 
So uh, uh, I think um, I know in the, in, the, in the interest of time, I will just show this uh, because I earlier talked about the non-compensatory pause. Because, and, and to complete this, I will show you what a compensatory pause means, which usually happens with the ventricular ectopy. Now, I said non-compensatory pauses usually happen with atrial ectopy, usually, not always. Uh, compensatory pauses usually happens with ventricular ectopy. What do you mean by compensatory pauses? A compensatory means, let's say a scenario where P wave conducted the QRS, P wave conducted the QRS like this, P QRS, P QRS, P QRS, and then you get a ventricular ectopic beat. And this ventricular ectopic beat tries to go from the ventricle back to the atrium. And let's say it gets blocked when it goes to the atrium, it gets blocked in the AV node because it's going the backward direction. But the sinus P wave doesn't know that the ventricle is beating, it tries to come down. And it gets blocked too, because the two beats meet at the AV node or somewhere, they extinguish each other. So the sinus P just keeps firing as if nothing happened, because sinus P doesn't know that the beat didn't go to the ventricle. So the sinus P keeps firing. And in this instance, this premature ventricular impulse did not change the way the sinus node is beating. So the, but my point is, uh, uh, sorry, let me go back. So the, the P to P interval, when you see this white QRS complex, P to P interval is exactly the twice the P to P interval. And that's a compensatory pause. In the previous instance, P to P interval is less than two times. So ventricular ectopy usually has a uh, 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 compensatory pause, compensatory pause to measure that you need to measure the P wave to P wave interval. And, and then, then you know this is more likely to be a ventricular ectopy. But not always, not always. This is a problem in medicine. Uh, there are times that this is a called interpolated ventricular ectopy. When you see a white QRS, it falls right in the middle of two QRS complexes. But if you look at this, the heart is beating as if nothing has happened. This PVC did not change. Uh, there was no pause after the PVC. The heart was beating like that. So this is called interpolated. It just managed to squeeze in uh, itself in, in the middle of uh, two beats because it just walked in here. It got blocked, but the P waves are just firing away and the QRSs are happening the same way. And this can happen. So absence of a compensatory pause does not always exclude the PVC. Um, Dr. Kotek, what I think, uh, uh, again, I, I explained this. This is the same ECG I showed you earlier. When you say your white QR is complex, this question always arises, is it aberrancy or PVC? I hope I gave you some clues. Uh, this is an example of a patient, again, uh, from telemetry. And suddenly you see this white QRS runs. And the first question is, is it a non-sustained ventricular tachycardia or, or, or is it aberrancy? Now, when I look at it, first of all, I have to see PQRS, 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 and then here you see a P wave. So that is a premature atrial complex. And now you will know that, okay, premature atrial complex, and this looks more like a right bundle. This must be a PAC with aberrancy that's happening like this. So this is not VT, you don't have to panic or do anything about this. And you can see what happens is this patient in sinus sort of rhythm and suddenly gets these uh, runs, um, rapid rhythm from the atrium. And you can see it even continues here. The heart rate is faster. There are P waves, P waves, and suddenly settles in again. And this is not uncommon, even among sick patients in the ICU. Uh, these patients a lot of times have atrial tachycardia. Um, this is question number seven, if you I do not have time, uh, but I have 10 questions only. Um, you let me know whether it's um, getting too late for you, but otherwise I'll keep going until you tell me. Question number seven, if you don't mind putting that up. We got this the green light from the president. Oh, green light from the president. Thank you so much. Of course. Thanks, Thanks Dr. Okay. Um, um, and uh, uh, question number seven. Uh, this is okay. This is now, I'm shifting gears a little bit. Uh, the previous uh, uh, seven questions, I tried to highlight a little bit of a Brady type of arrhythmias. Uh, this is different, but this is a common problem, and that's why I, I thought highlighting this. So 35-year-old woman with end-stage renal disease on hemodialysis. Based on the ECG, just imagine this is somebody you just happened to see in the uh, uh, office. 
Uh, and what do you consider next? Now, this is very basic ECG reading. Um, and, and, and I'm not trying to trick you, but this is something we often forget, including myself. So what do you do next? If you look at this ECG, is there anything that strikes in your eyes? That's all I'm asking. What would you think? A patient is in front of you, just came for a routine check. You check medical history means, okay, what is going on? What are the things you're doing? What are the medicines you take and all that? Uh, by looking at something here, you think the patient needs an EP study or echo or coronary angiogram. It's not a trick question, but I just want to highlight a clinical scenario. What do you, basically I'm asking, do you see anything in this ECG before even ordering other tests? What do you see? Uh, please, uh, I don't want to trick you here, but at least if you thought about, is there anything that you might think be useful here? Now, um, I know it give you a very short time to make this call, but so don't feel bad uh, uh, because I did not make it very striking. Uh, I think in the interest of time, don't worry about this. I'll go with the answers uh, right now because I know this is not the uh, best way to give you a very compromised time to answer. You can put the answers up. Yeah. I think I got uh, this one medical history. I don't know what you saw here. Uh, the thing that struck me was actually whether you saw it. There are a lot of things in this ECG you can, you can talk about, but this is a woman, end stage renal disease, acute interval is long. Now, you may say this is not that long, maybe, but the simple trick, as you know, okay, first of all, this is a regular rhythm, and then you measure. RR interval here, and the QT interval, which is from the beginning of QRS to end of T wave. So by eyeballing, you can see that if you look at the RR interval and the QT interval, QT is more than half of the RR interval. QT has occupied more than half of the RR interval. And when the heart rates are pretty reasonable like this, <coughs> this is still below 100 beats per minute, that should strike. That's all I'm asking. You don't have to do it. If you see any time the QT interval is more than RR interval, just light bulb should go up. Okay, I just wanted to make sure this patient should be safe. Okay, that's what I'm coming. So the the although I told you that this is a patient who came to the office and had the ECG, that was not the case. This patient was having dialysis had a cardiac arrest. So that's how I got involved. And I'm looking at cardiac arrest in 35-year-old end-stage disease, renal disease. These patients are vascular disease, uh, 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 cardiomyopathy, all kinds of electrolyte problems and all that stuff. And, right, and obviously coronary artery disease is premature and premature coronary artery disease. It's all this is crossing your mind, but what strikes is that uh, if you have access to that, uh, how she had the cardiac arrest, and you can see how it happened. So here, I, for the QT interval measurement, um, you know, you put a line from the beginning of Q to the end of T, and then and then you correct it to the heart rate, and I measured it to 526 milliseconds. And it's long, I mean, obviously not the longest you have seen, but probably long enough in a complex scenario where she has electrolytes going up and down, all other things, a premature vascular disease. Uh, she basically died, fortunately, got resuscitated. And, 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 and this is, of course, different. This is a patient of mine with a congenital long QT syndrome, and obviously you should see the QT interval is long, very long. Uh, this is already over 600 milliseconds. 600 milliseconds, over three boxes. The previous patient, it was not very obvious like that, uh, but I thought just to keep an eye on that because it's something we easily miss in day to day. Uh, all may, you may need to do is just to, you know, adjust some medication. The patient may be on two medicines that can prolong QT, and by adjusting it, you might save a life just by adjusting medicines. In this case, um, I. Uh, she was on uh, on antipsychiatric medications as well. I could not show exactly what the culprit was, but we, we, we took the safe route. So, uh, and and then congenital forms of long QT, obviously, as you heard about it, it's associated with different ion channel problems. And I don't want to go into details, but look back, sometimes the ECG suggests, now in my patient earlier, if, uh, if, if it's long QT type 1, you get a uh, something like this. So very sharp outgoing, 
uh, and uh, and if it's long QP type 3, you have a flat, and that's probably, uh, uh, I can't say this patient had long QP3 or not, but that's how it looks like. Sometimes the ECG helps to subcategorize a long QP1, 2, or 3, which is a common response. So this is what they are prone to develop. Uh, when you have long QT and you throw PVCs, and if the PVC particularly comes after this long, short interval, uh, can trigger a polymorphic VT like Prasad, Prasad, and then you need to be rescued unless this is uh, pretty much associated with uh, bad outcome, including death. So that's that question. Um, and and here I have two more, uh, three questions, if you don't mind. I think this is an interesting one. Um, I don't want to trick you here either. Uh, this is, uh, put you put the next question up. Um, if you don't mind, uh, putting the next question up. Um, this is a 68-year-old woman with hypertension and dyslipidemia, and for four months, she was complaining of shortage of breath. She cannot even walk one flight of stairs without taking a break. Her basic labs, cardiac angiography, was normal. So what happened was, so this is one ECG, okay, to, I'll just walk you through a sinus rhythm and conduct it, and then somebody took another ECG, and that looks like this. Okay, you saw the previous one, and you see now. What do you see here? Now, this woman flips back and forth between this kind of a rhythm. Is it sinus rhythm? And you see there is a, something paused here. Uh, there's something that means like the AV block, like thing. I don't know where the AV block is. I need to test more. Or is it Mobitz type 1? Or Mobitz type 2? Or is it a PAC non-conducted? We talk about PAC non-conducted. Right? So all these things cross your mind. What do you think this could be? This matter is not. So you only see is P, P, E, P, but there is a pattern of beating, and one seems to be getting blocked, this piece. And she does it every now and then. So what do you think it is? You can give the answers, please. It's a 68-year-old woman. I'm basically, High blood pressure and hypertension. Um, uh, high blood pressure and sorry, dyslipidemia or hyperlipidemia. Um, you can get the answers, please. Yeah. So the correct answer is number one. You need more uh, testing to know. And I don't worry about it, but it just I want you to get an idea. So what do we notice here is <laughs> we have two beats. First beat is conducted. Second beat is not. And when you have a gap, what did I say earlier? Just make sure this is not a PAC. This is a non-conductive PAC. To call it a PAC, this P wave should be markedly different from the other. But if you zoom up and you look around all the leads, look at that one and 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 this P and the subsequent P, they look similar to me for the most part. So I think it's a it's a sinus P. Okay, that's one idea that comes to my head. And then what I see is in if that if I follow that hypothesis, is this one P, second P, second P is blocked. One P, second P, second P is blocked. It's two to one conduction if I follow that. Two to one conduction. Now the fact is that when you have two to one conduction, it's very difficult to know whether it's Wenke bar or type two block. Because to know Wenke bar, you need to have PR interval longer drop. Right, you have to see the PR interval getting long. At least you need to have three beats to call it Wenke bar. Otherwise, you don't see PR prolongation before you drop. You can still have Wenke bar two to one, but you can't prove it by looking at it very easily. You, there are some clues, but not always. So when it's two to one block like this, you need more information to know where the block is. Why? So, so, as you know, AV block, <coughs> some people call it, when the PR interval gets prolonged, you get first degree AV block. Some people don't like to use the word AV block, because there is no block there. <coughs> All beats conducted to the ventricle with a prolonged PR interval. But some, you know, traditionally we call it first degree AV block. Second degree AV block, some atrial beats are conducted. In first degree, all beats are conducted. Second degree AV block, some beats are conducted. With uh, Wenke bar or Mobitz type 1, you get um, PR interval get longer, longer, and drop. Usually, this uh, Mobitz type 1, the block occurs in the AV node. Type 2 Mobitz 
actually there is no gradual prolongation of the are able to conduct conduct a suddenly drop usually the block is below the heavy mode and we are we are we are, we are considering it a serious problem because when the block is below the heavy mode you may not have uh, an escape mechanism uh, if, and it can lead to complete hard lock but the most of the time we what we don't realize is that there is a third category called two to one atrial ventricular block that means some beats are conducted not all this two to one av block could be type 1 or type 2 but we cannot determine such is the case of my patient with this and the third degree av block no beats are conducted so all some or none and so in this patient is two to one av block and we need little more information before we uh, get into which whether the patient is more with type 1 or 2 so when you have two to one av block we have to determine its mobility type 1 or 2 so need more information because we don't have opportunity to see pr prolongation so what do you do just use common sense one is that what i commonly do is i'll just wait and wait keep get the patient hooked up to the ecg or telemetry and go back and see if the other ecg show suddenly this two to one becomes 3 to 2 or 4 to uh, 5 to 4 type of record and that might give me a clue right away it's just a patient you have a patient with your patient and then you get a longer rhythm strip and that or you look into uh, you can get old ecgs and see whether they give a clue the other thing is uh, if you want to give a point 0.5 mg or 1 mg of atropine if it allows iv and see what happens to this block it's a sort of like an experiment now imagine now i get back to the physiology of thinking atropine you know being it, it, it reverses the uh, it, the the, the uh, vagal activity reverses so as you know the vagus nerve innervates the av node but not below the av node that's the basic physiology av node so if a trip if the block is at the av node if the block is at the av node atropine takes it away if the block is below the av node atropine has no effect so look at this so if you give atropine to take the vagal parasympathetic activity away the sinus starts beating fast the parasympathetic away and if the block is at the AV node, now that is also taken away. So sinus is firing faster and everything is conducted. So your block improves, right? If the block improves with atropine, that means the two to one gets one to one or whatever, or, or three to two at least. If it's an improvement, more beats are conducted, that means block should be at the AV node. But if the block is below the AV node, if you give atropine, the sinus node is firing faster because you took away the <coughs> vagal uh, action on the sinus node. But even the AV node conducts faster, but it cannot go below that. So you have more sinus P waves, but even now you're less going down, not less going down, the same number may be going down, but now have, you have more P waves, so your block looks worse. So, so that's why in some bradycardia scenarios, of course, by knee-jerk reflex, when you have bradycardia, we say give atropine, not always you make it better, you can make it worse also. But that's a bedside manual to help you to, to decide the level of block. Now, I will show you what happened in this, this is scenario where I had a patient with 2 to 1 conduction, in, uh, uh, another patient, and then I obtained another ECG, and you can see that I uh, didn't do anything just by waiting. This, it became PR into a get longer and drop. This is 3 to 2 when keep up. So just by waiting, I realized that this 2 to 1 block is the same thing like same patient. So the block must be in the AV node most likely. That's 3 to 2 conduction. And this is another patient, 2 to 1 block. This is an elderly lady. Um, you have sinus rhythm, sinus rhythm, and this is a left bundle branch block pattern. Remember I told you in V1, if predominant QRS is down going and white, it's, we call it left bundle. If it's going up and wide, we call it right bundle, and sinus rhythm and left bundle, and this piece get blocked, two to one block. And I wait a little longer, what do I see? The patient has complete hard block here. 
you see the P waves are firing separately compared to the QRS. QRS, fortunately, this patient has a rhythm and this is a complete hard block. So this must be the block is below the AV node. And just by waiting, this patient obviously needed a pacemaker, uh, whereas my previous patient probably don't need immediately unless there are symptoms. So uh, basically, uh, some people try to look at the 2 to 1 ECG. Uh, some clues are there if, uh, if the conducted beat has a long PR interval, it's probably the AV node is the block. If it's a very short PR interval, like less than 160, it's probably below the AV node. And as you noticed in my previous patient, if the QRS is wide uh, like this, probably the block is below the AV node like here. If it's narrow, it should be at the AV node, and I talk about what the atropine can do. If the block is at the AV node, atropine improves the block. If the block is below, there's no improvement or worsening of the block. So in this day patient, I will just tell you, just for the so-called fun of it, what did I find? Um, I did a quick EP study, don't know how to know in detail, but I thought at least for some of you who don't know much electrophysiology, just to see what we do in the lab. Everybody can relate to this, takes only a couple of minutes. I don't take too much time. Everybody can relate to this ECG up here in purple. This is the paper speed 25 millimeters per second, but we are measuring it digitally. So you have PQRST, and as you see, this patient is conducting when she came to the lab. PQRS, PQRS. And then we put a catheter in the atrium, it's called high right atrium, which is in green. And when a catheter in the ventricle, right ventricle, called right ventricle here. So green is atrium, white is ventricle, and in between I we put a catheter and the bundle of his location. Bundle of his because it goes from sinus node through the AV node, bundle of his through the perking system to the ventricle, right? So a sinus node, AV node, bundle of his, right left bundle, perking and ventricle. So PQRS, PQRS. P or A, we call it atrial or A wave, and this is a bundle of, uh, this is actually a sharp signal here. It's the ventricle, bundle of this should be somewhere here, and I'll show you that. And this is 25 millimeters per second paper speed. The, in the electrophysiology laboratory, we never, almost never use 25, so we, we stretch it out. We can do it electronically, so you go to 50 millimeters per second. The same ECG just stretched out. And then you can see, P wave QRS, P wave QRS, corresponding to the P wave, I have a signal in the atrium, right? And corresponding to the QRS, I have a signal in the ventricle, and that's the ventricular signal, and, and in the His, which is right in the middle, you see a signal here, sharp signal. It's, you know, you have to learn to find it, but it's there. It pops in and out because the heart is beating. It's there. There's a His there. There's a His somewhere here, and here you can see it again. So. P atrium through the his going to the ventricle. And here it's going one to one. One to one. And I waited a little bit, and then what I did was I stretched the paperwork out further. So now we had hundred paper speed, the same heartbeat. You get a PQRS, PQRS, you have an atrial impulse, ventricle impulse. But what did I notice? Now this needs a little bit of I I I I see that there are two his signals here. Now, first of all, I had to make sure I'm not having an illusion. But I repeatedly saw this is a very subtle one. So that means the electricity gets very slowed down inside the bundle of this. This is intra delay. Intra. It's not common to see this. So it's coming down the sinus P. But the his bundle usually should not have a delay because his bundle is a specialized conduction system. It should conduct fast. But there's a delay. And then when I watch and, and I look, look at it, here it is, double signals in the hits. And if I waited enough, I suddenly saw, look at this one, P, Q, R, S, here P, R, in turn gets longer. And corresponding to that, this intra delay got longer. This is not in the AV node, it's below the AV node. And then suddenly, if you wait long enough, sorry, this marker didn't come out well, suddenly, this last beat, had only one his signal, it did not conduct. That means it blocked at the his level. This is infrahisian block. When that happened, this patient 
uh, you know, there's a high risk of simply heart block any time. And this is what's happening when she was exercising or whatever, she cannot conduct, needs get blocked. Uh, she didn't have any other reason why she had it. I looked into other causes of this, couldn't find, uh, probably uh, it's age related, she ended up getting a face face. So that's I want to highlight. I think in the interest of time, unless you say I have two more cases, but I'm happy to stop here too. Uh, what do you have, uh, so we can go on for a little longer, a few minutes. Okay, thank you. And uh, I think this is interesting. Yeah, um, yeah the two uh, cases we can uh, we can finish, sir. Yeah. Oh, thank you so kindly. So please put up the question. Uh, these two cases are fast. I'm probably more interested. Um, so, 65 year old woman who underwent cardiac angiography and stents in to the left anterior descending. One day ago, and she is, you know, in the hospital. The, in the lab, when she then they were uh, putting the stent in, she had a um, run out ventricular tachycardia, short one, didn't have to take care of anything. Stent was properly deployed, and everything was fine. She was fine, and then she developed these runs in the in telemetry. Um, and what is your next step once you see this? You increase the beta blockers. You reconsider uh, repeat coronary angiography. You start amiodarone, or you just say, oh, okay, no worry, just be happy. Reassure. Please answer. And you can put the answers up. Very good, very good. I'm very happy. Most of you are understood what it is. So this is a key because if you don't do that, any of the other three interventions could have happened. So what do we have here is uh, motion artifact of the patient. And, and how do you know that? So you first of all, you find QRS complexes and you can see some, um, um, you know, the baseline is not so straight. Now that's a clue, but at least what you try to do is you try to find things that you can locate. So first of all, in this one, I saw QRS complexes. And then um, the other thing is this QRS here, they look bizarre. They don't look kind of now. Now that's a bad feeling. And then what I try to do is, when you find the QRSs that you know they are clearly QRSs, you try to march them today. So I put a caliper and try to see. Well, do I see anything there? Not sure. That's why I put highlighted in this uh, yellow orange color. Blue means I know for sure this is a this is a good QRS. I march out. Huh? Yes. Now I see. That QRS looks identical to that. So this must be a QR. Once you see this, you clinch the diagnosis, right? But you can keep marching them out. This one, I'm not sure because it's inside. But here, now suddenly I see that QRS is identical to that and to that. So I can march them through like that, right? And in the bottom strip, I can't start from left side. If somebody gave you only the bottom one, you start backwards because you start with the things you know, you see, uh, sorry, you see, it starts from here. Now this looks like a jungle. How do you know? So you try to march them through. I don't know whether there is something there because it's not sure, but after the fact, this sharp signal may be the same here. I don't know. I go there. But now suddenly I see, yeah, the caliper exactly takes me to this spot. That QRS is the same as that. Earlier I didn't see that. Only the caliper helped me to see that. And I try to, I'm not sure, maybe it is down going, but Calipus takes me there. Maybe down going part is the same as that one. And clearly, maybe here, maybe here, but there, there is something, I think. Not sure, but there is something. So you can see that marches too. So that's another clue, uh, this, this, this kind of a marching through and there's a preceding pattern. So this is artifact, good job, most of you got it. Um, and then the last question is this. Uh, I thought for interest sake, uh, I finished here this presentation. Please put that up. Um, this is a patient I've seen some time ago, so this is a paper you see I had to copy. It's a 24 year old man. Uh, this is totally a different question. Um, um, with no cardiac history and presented to the emergency room with uh, sustained palpitations and near syncope. 
So they had to uh, do an electrical cardioversion to establish the sinus rhythm. And so here I have a young man with no heart history uh, prior to that other than this ECG. Um, and then uh, go back and forth, and when he's in sinus rhythm, that's his ECG. I and mean, this is a patient of mine I like, saw so some time ago. Um, and this is all I have. We don't have much history, no, nothing in the family or anything like that. Um, but again, my, if I just want to highlight a clinical scenario. Uh, differential diagnosis can be broad here in a young, otherwise healthy. But if you have these two ECGs, at least you should be leaning towards one of these four. Is it Wolf Parkinson Y, uh, erythmogenic? cardiomyopathy, which is erythmogenic right ventricular, some people call it, cardiomyopathy, or long QP or Brugada. Please answer the last question. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, and please put the answers up, please. Okay, the correct answer, yeah, you understand you can consider Wood Parkinson why? Because it's a young man, uh, statistical probability. I don't blame you for that, but at least because we need more information to make a diagnosis. But uh, one third of you thought this could be a rhythmogenic cardiomyopathy. And what are the clues? Obviously, uh, this is not long QT syndrome because the long QT syndrome does not present with monomorphic uh, white complex tachycardia. Remember, I showed you earlier long QT syndrome. If you get ventricular tachycardia, it's polymorphic uh, type of ventricular tachycardia, specifically called torsade uh, one. And then Brugada syndrome, you don't get monomorphic ventricular uh, monomorphic white complex tachycardia. Brugada syndrome, you pretty much get very vicious looking ventricular fibrillation type of thing. So the last two answers are out. Uh, you can sometimes argue this could be uh, Wolf Parkinson White, uh, but I don't want to go into detail. But uh, not in, sometimes you have to show what you have in front of you is a regular white complex tachycardia, and the differential diagnosis could be several. But you go further, and uh, and then uh, uh, you try to look into see with the white complex tachycardia are there things like atrial ventricular dissociation or something like that. In that case, this is ventricular tachycardia. But more so, remember what I said, what type of white complex? is down going broad in lead V1. This is left bundle type of tachycardia. So this is left bundle broad uh, QRS tachycardia, white complex tachycardia. If it's a left bundle tachycardia, most likely this is coming from the right ventricle. So I have to think about arrhythmogenic right ventricular cardiomyopathy. And when I look at the next ECG, I see T wave inversions here, T wave inversions there. And that's another thing. <coughs> now sometimes you see T wave inversions even lead V3. In normal circumstances, we don't care much about these T wave inversions. We see this on and off and then we dismiss them. But in this case, I just could not. The other reason is that I did not see at least a delta wave here to call it pre Citation or with Parkinson White. And, and I saw I was leaning towards right ventricular cardiomyopathy. Obviously, I had the privilege of doing more testing on this patient, and it indeed happened to be erythmogenic right ventricular cardiomyopathy. A patient went on subsequently over the years to have a defibrillator and even more ablations, and he's fine. Uh, his children are moving on with life, couldn't find a genetic reason. But uh, there's another patient of mine to finish, I just show you. It's not the same patient, erythmogenic cardiomyopathy. Uh, you can see uh, that uh, the right ventricle coming here, there's aneurysmal changes, and here you can see the whole the cardiac MRI. This patient already had a defibrillator, that's why it's shining here. Um, this patient, the right ventricle is enlarged, and the very significant hypokinesis or dyskinesis in the right ventricle wall, and the left ventricle is also down, it's not normal. So sometimes these patients have biventricular cardiomyopathy, not only right ventricle, and, 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 and this patient, same patient, uh, this is a right ventriculogram, not the left ventriculogram, and, 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 and you can see that bulging of the, uh, the infundibular area of the right, the right ventricle consistent with aneurysmal form. So this is a uh, uh, patient actually had a, this particular patient had a rhythmogenic biventricular cardiomyopathy and there uh, I stop and I thank you for your attention and also apologize for exceeding the time. Okay, thank you very much sir. Uh, we have come to a successful end of the successful session. So during the, this session all got a chance to 
uh, learn new things as well as refresh our knowledge regarding basic uh, concept of ECG interpretation and cardiac electrophysiology. Because of the time limitation, I don't think we have time for questioning, but it have, would, would have been better we have a time for a questioning, but because of time restriction, we have to stop our session here. On behalf of Sri Lanka Cardiac uh, Sri, Sri Lanka College of Cardiology, uh, I would like to thank Dr. Mian Vijaytunga for your nice presentation on bas basic ECG interpretation. Thank you, sir.